it's Butterfly. How are you? Thank you for coming to Flutterby. I really appreciate when you come and visit. Um, I also really appreciate when you put some comments uh, down below. So, you know, let me know what you liked about this video. Um, I am going to do a really quick, hopefully quick, book review because I'm going to get uh, cut off at 18 minutes and 56 seconds. So I'm going to try and not ramble too much. Here we go. Uh, this is about everybody's guide to natural ESP. Unlocking the extrasensory power of your mind, Ingle Swan. Okay, this book was published first uh, in 1991. And this is a copy from 2017. So quite recently. Um, but he published this during his lifetime. And he was, of course, um, if you look up Ingo Swan, there's his name. If you look him up, he was uh, basically the father of remote viewing. He talked about ESP. He was very um, extrasensory ever since he was a very a young child. Um, he does talk a little bit about his um, experiences, his personal experiences. But more specifically in this book, what he talks about is... Um, the whole experience of ESP, of being able to read or sense something from elsewhere, and about the interference that um, can blur or change or alter some of the, uh, the reading that you give. So being that he was the subject of many scientific experiments, um, he explains how he felt like he was poked and prodded and and, and asked a lot of different questions, but how do you do these things you do? And how, how can you tell what's in that envelope? Or how can you tell what's, you know, on the other side of the planet and be accurate? Um, how can you describe this location with such accuracy? Um, and he, you know, he had to really kind of systematically break that down so that he could convey that information. So I think that this book is basically that. Um, if he were alive today, he would probably keep to this, but probably add a lot more to it because it, it, now that I have read about remote viewing, which he was, he was, um, he developed it, um, and it was probably still in its developing stages at the time of the publication of this book, I would assume, um, I read some information that has been, uh, kind of published about it since. And it seems like it's been a lot more broken down, a lot more systematically kind of um, made into a procedure, essentially. So uh, the procedure of controlled remote viewing or co coordinate remote viewing is not really broken down so much here. This looks more like a, a beginning stages. So when he's talking about ESP, what he basically is, explains is that you have interference um, in between you and the target, the target that you're trying to read whether it's a location, a picture, a person, or whatever, that you were trying to describe, you, ha you anybody who's human, <laughs> um, and maybe animals as well, who knows, they don't have the same language as us, but that you can read what's going on, uh, you can read the target. However, in being able to translate that information of the reading down onto paper, there's interference in that translation. And so that's what he ends up talking about quite a bit. Um, not only about the things that can interfere, but about how to how to kind of be aware of those labels and um, and that interference and those like those uh, opinions and those thought processes and those those feelings and if you have artistic sort of inclinations to try and label the thing that you're seeing rather than describe it, those things all interfere with the transmission of the the like the reading itself. So he systematically brings it breaks it down and he does have quite a lot of um diagrams that uh, where he's trying to kind of explain uh how that all works this is a diagram that i found that was probably the most helpful to me so i'm going to just kind of put that there in hopes that you can see that and perhaps pause it um, now, essentially what this is, is when on the top of that, that graph, what he's talking about is the first reality. And that is the reality that we know and see and that we won't argue that this is, you know, this is what it is, right? We have the material and the, what we can touch and what is tangible, what we can hear, what we can see. 
Now there's your, uh, um, your consciousness, but even consciousness can be broken down further. So there's your awake cult consciousness, and then there's different levels there, thereof. Um, and then there's cultural and educational and value imprints. So for instance, if somebody is seeing a thing, a number of people from different cultures in different parts of the world are seeing a thing, you are going to interpret that thing based on what you think and what you know, your language, your cultural values. So some people may see a, you know, a flying hag, other people may, may call it a witch, some people may call it a specter, some people may call it the great whatever. Um, but you're going to use the words to describe as best as you can and sometimes those cultural and 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 value labels um will determine the language that you use to describe the thing that you're seeing or that you're sensing so that's one thing that interferes uh the other thing that can interfere is past consciousness or past experience so if you're seeing a thing and for hen for whatever reasons it's bringing up some past uh trauma or some past recollection or, or associations, then that can then again um, skew the way that you describe the thing that, that, that is the target. Um, then he talks about subliminal barriers, and here we are. So we I just talked about these things, and then there's subliminal barriers. So some things that may or may not be as obvious that, that he talks about more uh, in the book. And then there's a the psychic nucleus. Uh, further down, there's the deeper self. And that is what you're trying to turn into. And just beyond the deeper self is what he calls the second reality. And in that second reality, there is no time, uh, no space, no past or future, and all information is available. In which case, what we're saying, or what he's saying, is that there is no time and space in that second reality. That uh, you can see just as clearly what there was in a certain location 15 years ago, 200 years ago, or next week, or right now. Um, it just as easily, you know, one image uh, or the other image is, is just as easy to, to sense. But then, it, then the question becomes, how can you know that what you're saying is that place right here and now and not like in the past or in the future? Um, but he really does a good job in, in kind of explaining those things um, systematically and and not kind of going off topic. So I'm going to try and do the same thing. <laughs> um, right. So let's see. Here's another couple of diagrams that he shows. And they look very similar, but they're actually a little bit different. But these are more diagrams where he's kind of talking about that all that information is available and to get it up to where you want it, where you can actually say it into your aware consciousness um, can have some, um, some things can impede. Here's another diagram. Okay, so that's why if I'm seeming a little convoluted, it's because there were a lot of things that were explained. Now, uh, to be as succinct as possible, I'm just going to go right to this part of the book where he talks about the drawings, where he talks about the drawings and essentially what it is is uh, you, and he encourages you, the reader, to make up your own experiences, your, your own experiments. Uh, find your neighbor, your friend, somebody who you can work with, um, and for them to make a display on a table. Uh, in a different house, in a different room, in a different place. And you are then trying to sense it and draw it and uh, describe it in an accurate way. And then, of course, uh, now with technology, back when he was writing it there in this book, there's a page where he was saying, of course, that you will only have to be able to kind of call your friend and see if it's accurate. No, now since 1991, when this was published, we can now actually have video uh, communication or pictures sent instantaneously and say, here, Joe, this is, this is the picture that I sent you. And then you can compare it immediately with the picture that you drew and see just how accurate you are or which aspects of it that are accurate. Now, for instance, uh, this would have been the target in one experience. Now, uh, he was kind of showing, I'm saying experiences, experiments. Uh, some of these experiments have been um, over the last, say, 150, 200 years. So he gives the dates and the people uh, so that you can look up the research where this comes from. So this is a well-sourced document. So if this was the the hidden uh, target somewhere, hidden meaning that the person who was drawing or was uh, reproducing the target was having to reproduce it, this 
uh, was what was drawn. Now that in itself is actually really pretty impressive, isn't it? You know, you don't, you, somebody just hides a thing and says, go ahead and draw it. And you come up with something that's anywhere close like this. This is, this is a remarkable thing. However, we can all do it. Um, I've actually done it and I've done it on a number of occasions and a number of different things and a number of different, uh, like I've represented, I've drawn a representation of things. So, and I'm sure um, that if you were to try the same thing, following some of the information that I give you, you will see that it's really, really not, the more you do it, it's not terribly un unusual. It's it really not. So it sounds kind of convoluted when you first hear it. But uh, I've kind of gotten rid of that shock value a couple years ago, so, um, or several years ago. So it's, it, if this is the first time you're hearing about controlled remote viewing, um, you know, get on board because a lot of people know about it. So these are, these are, so this would be the target and this is what a person drew. This would be a target. This is what the person drew. Now you're not going to get 100% accurate. These are, the, these are remarkable drawings. These are the most like worth publishing in a book, right? You're not going to get a hits like this every time. But suffice it to say that there's levels of accuracy. So if this is the target and this is what is being drawn, I mean, you're not drawing a star or a campground. You're drawing pretty close. Now, he has, um, in talking about some of the uh, layers of interference that you could have with your ESP, he breaks it down into like four different uh, areas, I guess. And he talks about error contributions, associations, lacks of, lack of fusions, and accuracies right here. Those are the four kind of areas that he breaks it down to. Um, and then he gives um, pictures that illustrate those things. So for instance, um, if this is the picture that is the target and the person is drawing this, it takes a number of times to kind of get something. So he's drawing this, the person's drawing like an umbrella that's opening and closing. So you're actually getting the potential for movement uh, out of the picture. Here, there's a pair of scissors drawn here. There's a crisscross. So there's really kind of, those are, those are interesting sort of hits. Um, however, here you're getting parts of the target. So here's the target. Um, these are what one person or some people are drawing. I forget exactly how it works, but here you're getting the elongated sort of larger on the top. Here you're getting the S shape with a vertical. Um, and here you're getting that donut shape on the top, right? You're getting parts of it, zones of it. And that's why it's really important when you have like a target picture that's something like a forest. You really don't know if the person who's drawing a squirrel is in the forest kind of thing, right? Um, but it would have to be something that is clearly obvious in the picture. Like if you're not seeing a, a squirrel in the picture itself, then you're not, it's not a hit, right? It's not a hit. You may be drawing a trunk, but it would have to be something that's actually on the target to be, to be a hit. But the thing is, is that there are, um, you can, you can do piece, bits and pieces of the target. He shows that too, like here, the giraffe. So here the target is a giraffe. The person draws and writes giraffe and then these four ice cream cone type things are kind of like the four bits on his head. So that is kind of a disconnection. Um, but still quite impressive. Still quite impressive. This is another one where these things are broken down into bits and pieces. There you got a nasty swastika. And of course I do have like a cultural bias when I see that picture and so there's your target and then these things and it says these pieces don't go together and they're trying to kind of draw what they're seeing or sensing right okay so the research has really been uh has has been quite developed since then there's a lot of really wonderful pictures here too like here there's a picture of a house and uh here the person is drawing pillars and a target and part of the the turret so on and so forth this would be a really great hit right here. There's the target and there's the drawing. Um, so there's the target and there's the drawing. Okay. Uh, then he talks about what is going to be happening. Towards the end of this book, he talks about how, you know, what, what he's expecting in the future uh, with regard to this. And I see that I have um, a few minutes left only to this video. So I'm going to try and cut it short. 
and introduce this to you, which is something you can get online. I got this online. I printed it just as a PDF straight from the computer. I don't even know where the link is. Um, I did it a few years ago. It's been well used. Um, in my last video, I erroneously called it SRI, the, I think I think I called it like the Stratford Research Institute. It's actually the Stanford Research Institute, Cellini, whatever. And you will see in this, um, in this document, um, the way to kind of break things down into different, um, what you see, what you feel, how you can describe things. And uh, essentially it goes back to the beginnings of what Ingo was talking in the beginning of his book where he was saying, you know, labels are a problem. When you try and interpret what you're sensing, uh, what you translate, what comes out of your mouth can be very misleading because you're trying to explain what you see and so you give the label itself. Uh, in my last video, I gave the label of a, like a, a belt, the example of a belt. So instead of calling it strap-like with a natural material and very long with holes and a, and a metal type square piece, um, that would be the right way to kind of describe um, what it is that you're seeing and to remove any kind of cultural or kind of language labels that you would have and, and name the thing, like label it with calling it a belt. Uh, you might call it strap-like. There's a lot of, you know, hyphen-like sort of descriptions, uh, giraffe-like, uh, that you could use to describe. But this book really kind of gives you a lot of information about um, how to describe the textures, the senses. Uh, use all of your senses to explain what it is that you're seeing. And then, um, as Ingo explains, you know, make your own experiments to... Um, to exercise that muscle, exercise that con that level of consciousness. Um, so a lot of people who do watch my channel, I would call it probably a witchy channel, and I do talk about astral projection and that sort of thing um, at times, but uh, I also talk about tarot cards. And you might, you might actually get a bag full of pictures from from calendars and cards. You might use um, some of your tarot card decks and um, just pick one blindfolded and try and describe what it is that you see and then uh, compare that picture to the explanation that you've given uh, to see how accurate you can be and of course there are exercises online if you look through um, to uh, Lynn Buchanan. Lynn Buchanan has um, a website where you can use some exercises to improve your sense, your, your ESP, your psychic self. Um, I'm definitely going to put a link to, to him down below. So I'm running out of time and uh, in the interest of kind of trying to keep this as succinct as possible, I'm going to wish you well. If you have any questions about this, please do leave them in the comments down below. Uh, I just wanted to kind of say this is a really good book. Um, uh, there are things that are uh, that add more information now that this book ha is kind of dated, but this is really good to sort of go back to the oranges or oranges origins of what was being described as um, you know relatively new technology back in the day. Incidentally, 1991 was before the military actually declassified the um, CRV. Um, because that was declassified in like 97 or 98. So it's interesting that he would have been written, writing this at that time, and that's probably why he didn't go into detail about the, the stepwise fashion that they break down the ability to kind of read um, all of that stuff, you know, as well as they do at this point. So there's lots of information online. Um, enjoy, explore, and really, uh, you know, take some time to develop your psychic self because we all have it. We really do. Take care.